Chen, assalamu alaikum. Uh, we'll try and uh, solve uh, this chemical bonding worksheet now, uh, uh, which is based on shapes of molecules and bond strength and coordinate bonds and sigma and pi bonds and intermolecular forces and the types of bonds. So we're going to go through uh, most of the topics, starting with the first one, which is uh, which is shapes of molecules. So here, let's start, begin with the first question. They're asking us to figure out, figure out the shape of... Uh, and ALCLC molecule. So you have to read the question uh, carefully. So you have to draw a diagram to show the shapes. Now, ALCL3, AL has just three electrons. All three are bonded to CL. So it's just three bonds. Three bond pairs, that's, uh, that's going to be fan-shaped, just like this. So the shape is known, known as, technically known as trigonal planar. Uh, it's a completely flat shape and the angle is uh, 120 degrees and PCL3. Uh, PCL3 with the shape is going to be... Uh, now, for phosphorus, you should know that phosphorus has five electrons. It's in group five. So three of them are bonding and there's one lone pair. So three of phosphorus's electrons are, are bonding and one of them is going to be your lone pair. So, so it's going to be derived from a tetrahedral shape with the top missing. Instead of uh, a bond on top, there's a lone pair on top. So one lone pair, three pairs of bonds, that's trigonal pyramidal shape. It's like a pyramid with a lone pair sitting on top. And the angle in this case is going to be uh, 107 uh, degrees. That's the angle, trigonal pyramidal. So watch out for these. Uh, always watch out for these lone pairs. Okay, let's uh, move to the next one. You're being asked to draw the diagram to show the shape of each of the molecules. So sulfur, it's got six electrons and he's already told us that uh, the oxygen atoms are making a double bond in SO3. So, so sulfur has is making three double bonds. So that means all six electrons are, have gotten used up. There's no spare electrons or lone pairs left. So that's going to be fan shaped. Three pairs of bonds. TK always consider double bond as one thing uh, because the electrons are together. So it's going to be fan shaped again. And this, uh, you have to, uh, what do you have to write over here? Uh, draw a diagram to show the shape and name each, name each shape. So this one is trigonal planar. Uh, now Cl2O, Oxen is in the middle. So remember, it's uh, oxen is group six. So it's making two bonds with Cl. So that means out of the six electrons, two are used up. So there are four electrons that are that are left, which means two lone pairs. So oxen is going to be, I mean, this thing is going to be derived from a tetrahedral shape because there are two pairs of uh, bonds and there are two lone pairs. So on two sides, you got... Cl atoms and on the other two sides you don't have anything attached except there are lone pairs present. So this side will not be counted as being uh, I mean this specific side will not be counted as being part of the shape uh, because there's nothing attached. So this is going to be a bent shape. It's going to be it's going to be bent and the angle is going to be 104.5. In the tetrahedral shape the angle was 109.5 but because of the greater repulsion of lone pairs the angle is now 104.5. Uh, let's do a, uh, some more, draw the Dorian cross diagram of an ammonium mine. So, so ammonium is this thing. If I can draw the circles properly, it's, uh, it's NH3. So there are three hydrogens that are attached to it. So N has three hydrogens that are attached to it. N has a total of five electrons. So there's a, uh, there's a lone pair that's sitting on top. And H plus one ion, which has no electrons, is going to be uh, attracted. So an H plus one that has absolutely no electrons will be attracted to the lone pairs of N. So that is going to give you a positive charge on the whole thing. Uh, you're going to replace the individual charges. Uh, the overall charge on this uh, entire molecule is now going to be plus one. It's now an ion. So remember, there are three normal bonds, and one of them is a dative bond. And H plus one ion has no electrons, and it's going to be attracted to the spare electrons that are available for nitrogen. 
and state the shape of the ammonium ion. So it's basically four bonds. Four bonds. We don't really care. The data bonds and the and the covalent bonds are considered to be identical. There's no difference. So it's going to be four bonds would be would be your tetrahedral shape. Uh, that's how. Uh, so the shape is going to be tetrahedral. And in your tetrahedral shape, the angles are one zero nine point five degrees. Then the next one is draw, draw the dotted cross diagram to show the structure of an H two S molecule. So sulfur has a total of six electrons. It's bonded to two. It's bonded to two hydrogen atoms. So that means uh, sulfur has four electrons that are remaining and predict the shape. So again, it's going to be derived from a tetrahedral shape where there's going to be two hydrogen atoms that sulfur would be attached to. And on two sides, it's two lone pairs and two bonds. On two, two sides, there's going to be lone pairs. So that side will not be counted as shape. So predict the shape. So this one is going to be bent. So it's or V-shaped. It's just, it's just V-shaped. Uh, and the angle would be 104.5 degrees. So count the lone pairs, count the number of bonds. So two lone pairs, two bonds, that's 104.5 degrees. Uh, then draw the dotted cross diagram uh, to show an ammonia molecule. We just uh, did that. So I'll just quickly do this again. So I've got these. So I've got these hydrogen atoms and there are your lone pairs. Uh, now draw the three dimensional shapes. So again, it's going to be derived. It's one lone pair and three bonds. So it's going to be derived from a tetrahedral shape. It's going to be on three sides. There's going to be NH3, three H's. And on the top, there's going to be your lone pair. So the top is missing. There's nothing. There's nothing that's attached on the top. So it's basically like a pyramid. It's a three-sided, it's a three-sided pyramid. And it's uh did he, he didn't ask us to name the shape. So we just uh I'll just ignore this, not write this. Uh that's it. And you forget the red lines. So draw the diagram to show the shape of a hydrogen molecule. Show clearly which atom is joined to which one. So so hydrogen is N2H4. So we have to draw the draw the N2H4 shape. And he was he's specific, he's specific about about the shape of the hydrogen molecule. So N has lone pairs. So remember, around the nitrogen atom, the shape is going to be trigonal pyramidal. It's going to be, it's going to look like this. It's uh, it's three bonds with one lone pair. So I'm going to draw that. And here's your other end. And that would be, I'm, I'm drawing an inverted pyramid because there's a lone pair sitting on top, lone pair sitting on top. This is H, this is H, and this is H as well, and this is H as well. So it's like this. This N is going to be pyramidal. It's going to be trigonal pyramidal, uh, three bonds. And then there's this other N, which is again going to be trigonal pyramidal. So I've drawn an inverted uh, pyramid. And you're supposed to figure out the oxidation state. We can do that quickly. Uh, N2H4, we know that H is plus one. So we don't know what N is, so that's X. There are two of them, so that's two X. H is plus one, and there are four of them. And the entire thing has a charge of zero. So it's going to be two X is equal to minus four. And if you then solve for X, it's going to come out to be equal to minus two. So that's your oxidation state over there. Uh, SF6 molecules, sulfur has six electrons. All six are going to get used up. No lone pairs. So six bonds. Six bonds is octahedral. There's going to be an F on top, an F on the right side, an F on the left side, an F at the bottom. There's going to be an F going behind this, and there's going to be an F that would be coming out of the page. So the shape is going to be octa, octahedral. Uh, the next one is draw the dotting cross diagram for an OCS molecule. So carbon 
is going to be making bonds with an O and an S. Carbon has uh, four electrons, so it's going to share uh, two over here. And it's going to share two electrons over here. Oxygen is in group six, so there would be two electrons left. Sulfur is also in group six, so there would be two lone pairs left, so four electrons left. Carbon has no lone pair, so you have to suggest the bond angle. So carbon in the middle is making a double bond over here and a double bond over here, and there are no lone pairs around carbon. Remember, it's always focused on the middle carbon atom. So the bonds are going to be as far away from each other as possible. That's going to be linear 180 degrees. So one bond is going to be on the right side. The other one would be completely on the left side. So now this one is determine the number of lone pairs of electrons around the nitrogen atom. So nitrogen is five electrons. So two are making bonds. So that means there would be three electrons left. Sulfur is in group six, six electrons. Two, it's making two bonds. So six minus two, that's, that's four electrons left. So sulfur has two lone pairs, while nitrogen has one lone pair. You can, you can kind of state that it's just 1.6, like 1.5. Like there's a half a lone pair, so I'm not going to count that. So which bond angle A or B would molecule will be smaller? So if you have more lone pairs, there's going to be more repulsion and the bonds would be pushed further away, which would decrease this angle. I mean, you've got more lone pairs. So these bonds over here, they could be pushed further away and they would be pushed closer to each other. So more lone pairs. Uh, so sulfur has smaller bond angles. So it's going to have smaller bond angles. Why? Because it's got more lone pairs. So bonds, they face greater repulsion. And are therefore closer to each other. Or are pushed closer to each other. So that's the answer to this part of the question. Then SF6 molecule again, the shape is octahedral we just discussed. And the bond angles are all 90 degrees. We just drew the SF6 molecule somewhere just before this question or even before this. So all the angles were 90 degrees, one bond on top, one on the right side, left, bottom, on the back side, on the front side, all the angles are 90 degrees. Now moving to the the PCL5 molecule. So shape of the PCL5 molecule is triangle. Five bonds, it's bipyramidal. So PCL5, is like this and there's a CL that's on top and there's a CL that's on the on the bottom that's PCL5 and the angles are so there's basically a fan and there's there's a bond that's on top of the fan one that hanging at the bottom of the fan so the angles would be 120 degrees between the fan and it would be 90 degrees I mean the the CL that's hanging at the bottom that's making 90 degrees as a moving further CS2 molecule so that's uh uh, not in cross diagram, so so sul carbon with sulfurs, uh, carbon is going to make a double bond here, and it's going to make another double bond over here. And sulfur is in group six, so there are four electrons left. This sulfur is in group six, two of them are making bonds, so four electrons left. Uh, the shape of the molecule, so it's uh, it's going to be linear because the middle atom has no lone pairs. So the bonds are going to be as far away from each other as possible. It's going to be linear and the angles would be uh, 180 80 degrees. Let's move to the next one, which is uh, we've, we've got a table. We have to figure out uh, the number of bond pairs for the, that's tetrahedral. And an example could be CH4, like carbon. 
just four bonds. So they would be as far away from each other as possible. And it's going to be tetrahedral. Now, what if you have three bonds and one lone pair? That's going to be trigonal pyramidal. NH3 is a good example. NH3 has the same shape as CH4, except that on one side, there's a lone pair instead of an actual atom bonded to it. So, so, so that's pyramidal. And if you have two lone pairs, two bonds, that's a, that's a water example. It's, a, it's oxen. Again, you can think of it as being derived from a tetrahedral shape. So oxen is going to make two bonds with hydrogen and on two sides, there's going to be lone pairs. So this is going to be V-shaped or bent or non-linear because the other two sides, there's nothing attached to it. So it's just two hydrogen atoms attached at an angle of uh, 104.5. So this is 109.5. They didn't ask for the angle. Uh, the lone pair causes repulsion, so the angle gets squeezed a little bit. Now we've got two lone pairs, so the angle gets squeezed a bit more as well. So 104.5. I should draw a dot and cross diagram of a TEF6 molecule. So uh, TE is in group six, so it's got uh, it's got uh, six electrons. So so just draw six fluorines around it. So TE is going to have six bonds with six fluorines. And the remaining electrons for fluorine So those are your remaining electrons for fluorine. So that's it. Uh, and the shape, uh, six bonds, that's uh, octahedral. And the angles would be 90 degrees. So it's, it's again the same. One bond would be on the right side, one on the left side, one F on top, one at the bottom, one would be Behind this, one would be in front of this. Here's another one, it's his bond angle in propene, so this one. So, so, so you're saying, what is the HCH in, in the double bond? So, so when you have a double bond, so it's CH2. And over here, you've got H. And then you have a CH3. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to describe the whole, all the angles. First carbon, the, the one with the, I mean, the one over here that I'm pointing to that CH3, uh, that's making four bonds. So four bonds is tetrahedral, that's 109.5. So all these angles are 109.5 degrees. Uh, when it comes to this carbon, the one making a double bond, there are three pairs of bonds around it. A double bond, a single bond, a single bond. So that would be fan-shaped. This carbon at the end is also going to have three pairs of bonds. There's going to be a double bond on one side, uh, one pair of bond over here, one pair of bond over here. So it's going to be fan-shaped as well. So the angles would be 120 degrees or approximately 120 degrees. So remember this, when carbon makes a double bond and or whenever you have three pairs of bonds, think of the double bond as one entity, one single thing. So if you have three pairs of bonds, the angles, it would look like a fan. It would be, they would be as far away from each other as possible and the angles would be 120 degrees. Uh, draw the state, the shape of each molecule. So we, we did this, we did NH3, that's, uh, I mean, they're asking for the, for the dot and cross diagram so you can, we can quickly do that. It's N will have a lone pair and there would be three H's and three single bonds. 
uh, CH4 will have four hydrogens around it. And uh, so this would be a uh, tetrahedral. And this one is going to be the same tetrahedral shape, except that the top, nothing at the top. So it's going to be pyramidal. So this one is going to be triangular pyramidal. While this one is going to be tetrahedral. Uh, so when uh, state each type uh, ammonium chloride, how many types of bonds are present? So. So he's saying, um, he's talking about ammonium chloride and uh, he's asking how many types of bonds are present. So ammonium chloride is an ionic compound. That's the first thing. It's, uh, it's the first thing is there's going to be, it starts off with it is ammonia. And ammonia has these lone pairs. So an H plus one that's passing around close to it will get attracted to those lone pairs and they would end up forming a dative bond. And which is why this entire thing will get a charge of plus one. And then you'll have a Cl minus one that will be attached to it. So there's going to be, so what type of bonds are present? So the first thing is there's going to be an ionic bond. Then there's going to be normal covalent bonds. I mean, no need to write normal. Just covalent bonds would be fine between the NH3 and then the lone pair of N will be attracted to the H plus one and that would be your, that would be your dative covalent bond. So three marks for this three. So you just have to, I mean, you could, you could answer it this way. That would be sufficient. Again, SO2 and SO3 shapes of the molecule. So SO2 will be They've already said that they, the oxygen are making double bonds. Sulfur is in group six, so there's going to be one lone pair. So that side, it would have been fan shaped. It would have been fan shaped, except uh, that particular side will not be counted in this shape because there's a lone pair. So it's going to be bent, and the angle would be 120 degrees or less than 120. Let's uh, call that 100 less than slightly less than 120. So it will be around 170 degrees to 120 degrees. Why? Because the lone pair has greater repulsion. So the other one, it just has three double bonds, no lone pairs because all six. So it's just a fan shape, triagonal planar. And in this case, the angle would be one, 20 degrees exactly. So, so you have to give the shape and the bond angle so you can do that. Uh, let's now, um, do another one first. So let's talk about uh, segment pi bonds. So over here, you've got, uh, you've got, he's saying, sketch the shape of each sigma bond and one of the bonds present in the space below. Show clearly the position of the nuclear of each atom. So the first thing is, when carbon makes just two bonds, two of, just two bonds. Uh, when carbon makes, sorry, not two bonds, when it's bonded to two atoms, that is kind of, uh, that is SP hybridization. SP hybridization, the carbon is going to look like this. I mean, the middle carbon atom is going to look like this. Like it's making one of its electrons, it's going to be pulled in one direction. One of its electrons, it's got four electrons, remember that. So one of its electrons is going to be pulled in this particular direction. So those are your SP hybrid orbitals. And then carbon has two electrons, which would not be initially bonding. They would be your, uh, your P orbitals. And then there's going to be one on the Z axis as well. So, so there's going to be one that would be going into the page and out of the page. So, so there's going to be one 
orbital that would be lying on the z-axis. But focus on the sp hybrid orbitals. Those are the ones that would be bonding to hydrogen over here. So you have to show. So they would be bonding with hydrogen. Hydrogen has an S and one electron in the S orbital. So that's your hydrogen atom. So there's going to be a bond that would be between the between the carbon and the hydrogen atom. So that's going to be your sigma bond. So you'll have a carbon atom over here, a hydrogen atom, and this is carbon's sp hybrid orbital. They're going to pull each other's electrons and they would start overlapping. So, so the bond would actually look like this. The electron density would be maximum in the middle. So, so here's your carbon atom and here's your hydrogen atom. This is, this is what you've got to show. Uh, so that's, that's the sigma bond. And then you have to show a, show a pi bond. A pi bond would be formed that you have a carbon atom and there would be bonds, a sigma bond between the nitrogen atoms. So carbon has these spare orbitals. Let's uh, look at this green one. That's your, so carbon has this spare green orbital. Nitrogen also has a few orbitals that are lying parallel to each other, parallel to carbon's orbitals and they would end up forming pi bonds. They would start overlapping above and below. So you just shade that. And that's what a pi bond. There's going to be two pi bonds over here because there's a triple bond. So all you have to do is just draw one pi bond over here. So then the next one is you're supposed to sketch 1s. So that's a spherical orbital. A 2s, that's a bigger spherical orbital. And you have to spe specifically draw 2px, which, is, uh, which would be on the x-axis. So that's your 2px. So how are two atoms in a covalent bond held together in your answer state? So basically in a covalent bond, what happens is that the two nuclei are fighting over electrons. So, so, so the shared electrons are being attracted by the nucleus of this atom. They're also being attracted by the nucleus of this other atom. So shared electrons in the bond uh, are attracted uh, and the force of attraction is electrostatic. by the positive nuclei of both atoms. So the next one is draw the uh, sketch to show, uh, show orbital overlap that produces a sigma bond in H2 molecule. So H2 molecule is, you have one hydrogen, you have another hydrogen. It's a spherical orbital with one electron. They're going to attract each of those electrons so the electron density would become maximum in the middle. So that's where the electron density, and this is what you're going to draw. This is what an H and H would look like. In the case of HCl, you have a hydrogen atom with one electron, and you have a Cl, which has a P orbital that has one electron in it. They're going to attract each other, and there's going to be an S and P overlap, which is why, so which is why it's going to look like this. So there's going to be an S and P overlap. Uh, what is meant by the term bond polarity? That is the unequal distribution of electrons of electrons in a bond which results in a slight positive and slight negative charges on the atoms. The next question is, why is the HCl molecule polar? Because uh, Cl is more electronegative. So the HCl molecule, the shared electrons are going to be closer to Cl, which results in a slight negative and a slight positive charge on the H. So Cl is more electronegative. 
So the shared electrons are closer to Cl, which is why Cl has a slight, or you can just simply write that Cl is slight negative and H is slight positive. Uh, next one, you're supposed to draw the pi bond. So pi bond, simple carbon has a p orbital. Remember in sp2 hybridized carbon atom, how did I know that this is sp2 hybridized? Because this is ethene that they're talking about. So when carbon is bonded to three atoms, then it is sp2 hybridized. So, so when, one second. So when it's bonded to three atoms, it is sp2 hybridized. So that means carbon is fan shaped, and there's one spare orbital, and they would they would overlap to form a pi bond. And that's it. You just uh, you just shade this. That's I mean, you can shade this. This is your this is your pi bond. So the next one is intermolecular forces. Why is the melting point of uh, SiCl4 is higher than that of PCl3? Now, now SiCl4 is not polar. Now remember there are three types of intermolecular forces. So SiCl4, the dipoles cancel out. So it's it's a non-polar molecule. That's the first thing. TK, we're talking about this question, SiCl4 being uh, having a higher melting point compared to PCl3. PCL3, on the other hand, is because of the lone pairs on top. Uh, PCL3 is going to be polar. The dipoles are not going to get cancelled out. CL is probably going to be the slight negative part. And P would have a slight positive charge. Uh, CL is probably more electronegative. So this is non-polar. This one is polar. But still, so a polar molecule is probably going to attract other molecules strongly, but... Uh, this is non-polar, it's a bigger molecule. Uh, and he's already told us that it's got a higher melting point. So SiCl4, you can write, is non-polar. Non-polar molecules have Van der Waals forces. Van der Waals forces or temporary dipole induced dipoles are the forces where the molecule has random fluctuating dipoles. Maybe this side becomes slight negative, this side becomes slight positive due to collisions. The electrons might get knocked to one side for a very temporary instant. And in the very next second, the negative and positive charges might not be there. So, so SSL4 is non-polar. It's got uh, Van der Waals forces. But since it's a bigger molecule, It has more Van der Waals forces. Compared to this uh, PCL3 molecule. Which is why SSCL4 has a higher boiling point. So remember, van molecules that have Van der Waals forces, if they're bigger in size, they can have greater intermolecular forces. PCL3, even though it's polar, but uh, they already told us, remember, they told us that this has a higher higher uh, melting point. So we had to figure out the reason. So it had more Van der Waals forces compared to this one. Uh, now, the colors of chlorine, bromine, and uh, chlorine is uh, greenish yellow. Bromine is a red-brown liquid. And iodine is a blue-black solid crystal, so that's uh, solid. This one is liquid, and this one is a gas. So what's happening to the volatility? Volatility is, the volatility is decreasing. It's Cl2 molecules are gaseous. Bromine molecules they've got more intermolecular forces because they are liquid. 
And iodine molecules, they have even greater, they have even greater intermolecular forces. So, so what's happening? They, they both all are nonpolar. Are nonpolar. So only Van der Waals forces are present. So only Van der Waals forces are present, and if only Van der Waals forces are present, uh, well, bigger molecules have more Van der Waals forces. So volatility decreases down the group. <laughs> so next is name the intermolecular force present in ice. Ice is whenever whenever you've got uh, O and H bonded together. It's a highly polar molecule and the lone pairs make it even more polar. So there's hydrogen bonds that are present. And he said uh, two water molecules showing the force. I did this over here. Uh, make sure you each lone pair will have a slight negative charge. Uh, slight negative charge over here. Uh, draw dotted lines from one of the H positive to the lone pair of the other atom. And remember, to only draw just one hydrogen bond uh, between water molecules, uh, because all the other positive and negative sides would be pointing somewhere else. Uh, so only two of them would be facing together. There's only going to be one Van der Waals forces. Oh, sorry, this is hydrogen bonds. So you, you're supposed to draw this exact diagram. So what will explain the trend in the boiling points of HCl, HPL, and HI. So, so you can see over here that uh, where's HCl? It's these boiling points. So this is, I think, uh, hydrogen halide. So this is HCl. This is HPR. And this is HI. Now we've got HCl and HPR and HI. So the boiling points are increasing. So the question is, I mean, you can look at the table and the boiling points are, uh, they are increasing. So why are they increasing? Uh, the explanation is that the molecule size increases. You got, you got a bigger molecule, this is smaller. And this one is bigger in size. So what happens when the molecule size increases? There's going to be more Van der Waals forces. So there's going to be more Van der Waals forces. Even though HCl is more polar uh, and HI is less po polar, but the Van der Waals forces in HI are a lot more. So it's got more Van der Waals forces. And we can add this. We can add this. Uh, maybe it's a two mark question, so you don't need to add this. Uh, so you can write that even though HCl is more po polar, but it's smaller in size. And has less Van der Waals forces. Uh, next one is HF doesn't follow the trend. So HF, why? Because it's got hydrogen bonds, the strongest of them all. Whenever fluorine is bonded to, it's one of the most electronegative elements. Plus it's got plenty of lone pairs. So the H and the F are bonded to each other. So that's, uh, that's, that's hydrogen bonds. And they are the strongest intermolecular force out there.
Next one, explain uh, using Muni as example by the meaning of the term bond polarity. So, uh, so bond polarity is use ammonia as an example. So not sure what to do, but uh, you can just show that it's, it's a very polar molecule. This is negative. This is H is positive. So, uh, so, so, the, so the question is, it's the unequal distribution of electrons in a bond. In a bond which, so which results in slight positive and negative charges on the atoms in the molecule. Why is it polar? Because N is, is more. So N is more electronegative. And the shape is pyramidal, so the dipoles don't cancel out. Don't cancel out. And then state one physical property of ammonia, which is caused by it's very soluble in water. It's got uh, high because it can form hydrogen bonds with water. Uh, it is uh, what else? Uh, it's very soluble in water. It's got high melting and boiling points. So we've written down two of them. Then the next is uh, dotted cross diagram of the ICL. So you got I and you got CL. That's it. And suggest whether melting points uh, increase from CL2 to, to, to CL2 to ICL. The molecules become more polar. So you got CL2, you got ICL. This a polarity, CL is more electronegative. Over here, it's non-polar. And this is going to be so you're going to comment on that, that there's a difference in electronegativity, the uh, difference in electronegativity increases. So just writing electronegativity increases. And there's, uh, there's stronger permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction. Interaction. Suggest which of these three molecules has the largest permanent dipole. So that's obviously ICL. It's got the most different, the biggest difference in electronegativity. Remember, electronegativity decreases down the group. So ICL is this has the strongest permanent dipole. Uh, showing. So this is just a repeat of the same question, I think. Explain the meaning of the term bond polarity. We did that. Uh, why the boiling points of HF is much higher than the boiling points of the other hydrogen halides. Uh, again, already told you that's hydrogen bonding. The other ones only have permanent dipoles and Van der Waals forces. So hydrogen bonding bonding is a lot stronger. Uh, this is about the thermal stabilities. Remember, bigger bonds are weaker. Not bigger bonds actually. Bigger atoms, they always make weaker bonds. So for example, you've got uh, HF, that's the strongest. HCl, weaker. HI would be very weak. Uh, bigger atoms, they're far away. So they have less orbital overlap. And uh, the, the further away, so that there would be longer bond length. So there's going to be less attraction because uh, the atom would be sh very shielded as well. The nucleus would not be, a, like iodine already has 53 electrons. Why would it be interested in hydrogen's electrons? It already has too many electrons. Its nucleus is already 
covered and with electrons, 53 of them. Uh, predict the shape of the H H2S. Now we're saying that, uh, draw the dotting cross diagram of H2S. So uh, we did this earlier as well. Predict the shape, it's going to be derived from the tetrahedral shape. On two sides, the sulfur is in group six, so there would be two lone pairs. So the shape uh, is going to be bent. It's going to be nonlinear, V-shaped. Uh, why is it H2O? Suggest why the melting and boiling points of H2O are much higher. H2O has hydrogen bonds. I mean, right, the whole thing, hydrogen bonds. While H2S has permanent dipoles only. And the last statement should be that hydrogen bonds are stronger than permanent dipoles. They are stronger than permanent dipoles. Draw the diagram to show the dipole present in propanone. Uh, you can Google propanone if you don't know what that is. So here's, remember the carbon and hydrogen atoms don't have a very big difference in electronegativity. The dipole would be over here. This oxygen would be negative. This carbon would be, would be positive. So that's probably the only thing I think they were asking us to draw. Uh, or maybe, no, they were just asking to draw the permanent dipole. So if they wanted us to show the permanent dipole interaction, we can do that as well. So positive, this is negative. And these two would be attracted to each other. Uh, calculate the total number of electrons, CSTF. You can do that on your own. State the close proximity of the boiling points of the two compounds. Uh, why are they, or what's the reason for the close proximity? of the two compounds. So this one is nonpolar. While this one over here is polar. Now the close proximity is that, uh, that they have almost, almost the same size. Uh, so almost, it's almost the same size. You can, you can CST and CST that's 15 plus 15, that's 30. Uh, CST is 15 plus, I think, uh, the flow is 19. So, so they almost have the same size. Which is why they're going to have similar Van der Waals forces. The next part is, why is this one slightly higher? Because it's polar. It's polar. Uh, because CST-F is polar, F is electronegative. So there's going to be permanent dipoles. There's going to be permanent dipole interaction. And because of permanent dipole interaction, uh, the molecules would be more strongly attracted. Now, uh, which causes ethanol to be a liquid? That's hydrogen bonds. Ethanol to be a liquid, why ethanol's got O and H together? So H is positive and the lone pairs are over here are negative. So this part is going to form hydrogen bonds. Draw a label diagram to show that we did. Uh, so we had to show the hydrogen bonds. So let me redraw this over here. This CST part, this carbon chain is nonpolar. So this part is negative, this H is positive and there's another Now this is negative, this is. 
and they're going to be attracted to they're going to be attracted to each other uh just show one make sure you just show one of them because uh, because of the shape the molecules can't really form more than one hydrogen bonds with each other so positive h with uh, of one atom attracted to the lone pair of the of the other one 